Hesiod's Works and Days, translated by David Green, read by Donald Miller. Muses from Pieria, celebrators in song, come hither to me and tell of Zeus. Sing of him, your own father. It is through Zeus that mortal men become famous or fail of fame. It is through mighty Zeus they are spoken of or left in silence. Lightly he makes a man strong, and lightly maims one who is strong. Lightly he lessens the famous, and will exalt the obscure. Lightly he straightens the crooked, and lightly withers the proud. He is Zeus, the High Lord of Thunder, whose home is the highest. Hear, see, give ear, straighten court judgments with justice. That is your part. I would wish to speak very truth of Perseus. There is no single breed of strife, but on earth there are two of her. One of the two you have but to see, and you will praise her at once. The other draws only blame. The hearts of the two are different. The one increases vile war and enmity. She is cruel. No mortal loves her. Only under necessity, through designs of the immortals, do they honor her, this harsh strife. The other is the elder, Black Knight was her mother, and the son of Kronos, whose throne is on high, who lives in heaven, set her in earth on its roots, and for men she is far better. This is the one that rouses even the shiftless to work. For a man may look at another, a rich man, in haste to plow and to plant, set his house in good order, and the shiftless, looking, longs for work. So neighbor is jealous of neighbor, hastening towards wealth. The strife is good for men. And potter has a grudge against potter, joiner against joiner, and beggar envies beggar, and singer singer. Persis, put all these things away in your heart. Do not let the evil delighted strife keep your mind from work, as you watchfully eye for quarrels, listening in the marketplace. Scant is the seasonableness of quarrels and marketplaces. For the man without a year's sustenance, reaped in due season, lying safe in his house, a harvest born of earth, the grain of Demeter. When you have a sufficiency of this, promote quarrels and squabblings over other men's goods. But in your case, there will be no second doing of this. Let us settle the quarrel once, now and forever with straightness of judgments, those best judgments that come from Zeus. Already we divided the estate, but plundered and bore off much else, gratifying mightily the kings, gift gobblers, very willing to render this kind of justice. Fools they are, not to know how much better the half than the whole is, and what great blessing there is in Mallow and Absol, for the gods have steadfastly hidden his livelihood from mankind. You could easily work a day's space and so for a year have a living with never a hand's turn of work. At once you could hang up your steering oar over the smoking heath, and the work of oxen and drudging mules would be ended. But Zeus, in the wrath of his heart, hid our living from us because Prometheus of crooked counsels cheated him. So Zeus contrived against men destructive sorrows. He hid fire, but in turn the crafty son of Epitus stole it from cunning Zeus for men, hiding fire in the narthic stem, unknown to Zeus, whose joy is in the thunderbolt. Now, in his anger, cloud-gathering Zeus spoke to Prometheus, son of Iapetus, whose cunning excels all others. 
You are glad now you have stolen fire and have cheated my mind. But it shall be to you yourself great mischief and also to men of the days they are still to be. To them, to match their gaining of fire, I shall give an evil to in which they will all joy, welcoming each in his heart his own ill. So he spoke and laughed outright, the father of gods and men, and he bade the famous Hephaestus with all speed make a fusion of earth and water, and therein set a human voice and a human strength, but in countenance making her like the immortal goddesses, a fair, desirable maid. He bade Athena teach her work, weaving the embroidered web, and golden Aphrodite to pour on her head grace and painful lust and anxious desires, that wear out the limbs he bade Hermes, the killer of Argos, instill in her the cunning mind of a bitch and a knavish disposition. So he commanded, and they obeyed, Zeus, son of Kronos, the king, and thus from the earth the strong smith shaped the likeness of a modest maid according to Zeus's design, and the goddess, golden-eyed Athena, girdled her, adorned her, and those graces, the goddesses, the queen persuasion, put on her body golden necklaces, about her fair tressed seasons wove a mantle of springtime flowers, all of these things a glory of the body. Pallas Athena fitted to her, but in her breast the conductor, the killer of Argos, set lies and dissimulation and words and knavish spirit. He worked by design of Zeus, the daughter thunderer, and a voice, the herald of the gods, put into her the name that he gave this woman, was Pandora, all gift for all that live, and Olympus had given her as a gift, as a bane to men that lived by bread. Now when he had completed this mischief, sheer and bewildering, the father sent the distinguished killer of Argos, the quick messenger of the gods, to afterthought, bearing a gift from him, and afterthought never bethought him, how Prometheus forethought had said, never accept a gift that comes from Olympian Zeus. Send it back, lest it's in some way ill will come about to mortal men. But afterthought took it, and only when he had taken the evil thing understood. For at first the tribes of men lived free of troubles, free of difficult labors, free from painful diseases that give men their deaths. But the woman, with her own hands, took away the great lid from the jar and scattered and for mankind she devised bitter sufferings. All that remained in the unbreakable walls of the jar was hope. She remained beneath the lips of the jar, and she did not fly out. Before that, the woman clapped to the lid of the jar. By design of the Aegis-bearing Zeus, who gathers the clouds, but other ten thousand evils have gone wandering among men. The earth is full of these ills, and the sea is full, and diseases by day and every night too come of themselves and bring to men mortal trouble. In silence for Zeus has stolen their voice. So true it is there is no way to escape from the purpose of Zeus. There is another story. If you like, I will tell you its substance well and skillfully and lay it upon your heart. It tells how the gods and mortal men spring from the same beginnings. It was of gold at the very first that the breed of men who use speech were made by the immortals who live in Olympus. They were in the time of Kronos when he was king in heaven. They lived like gods, their hearts undisturbed by cares, without labor, there came no wretched old age. Their hands and their feet were the same always. 
They found their joy in feasts, free of every trouble, and died like those conquered by sleep. All good things were theirs. The grain growing earth bore them crops full ungrudgingly of its own accord. At their will they leisurely did their work in the midst of their many blessings. And when the earth hid this breed in its depths, they are spirits by the plans of great Zeus. Good they are still on the earth's face and are guardians of mortal men. They are the givers of wealth. This too they obtained as their kingly function. Then those who hold their home in Olympus made another breed to follow. It was of silver and far worse than the other. Neither in form nor in mind were they like the golden, but a child among them for a hundred years by the side of his good mother was raised, playing great fool in his home. And when he grew up, came to his young man's measure. They lived but a little while, and through their folly had pains as well, for they had could not hold off from each other their reckless violence, nor were they willing to serve the immortals, nor the, on the holy altars of the blessed to offer sacrifice, as is right for men according to their several customs. But these again, Zeus, son of Kronos, laid in earth, angry because they did not give honors to the blessed gods who hold Olympus. And when this breed too, the earth concealed, they are called by mortal men, blessed ones under the earth. They are the second, truly, but honor attends them also. Then Zeus, the father, made yet another breed among mortal men. It was of bronze, and it equaled the silver in nothing. He made them of ash trees, a breed terrible and monstrous. What they thought of were groaning deeds of the war gods and acts of outrage. They ate no bread, their spirits, harsh thinking, adamantine. There was no yielding to pressure in them. Their power was huge, and from their shoulders grew their hands, defying any grapple over their thick limbs. Bronze was their armor, and bronze were their homes, and with bronze too they worked. There was no black iron. By their own hands were they conquered, and went to the moldering home of chilly death. They had no names, but for all their terribleness black death laid hold of them, and they left the bright light of the sun. And when this breed too the earth concealed, yet another, the fourth on the earth that feeds many, Zeus son of Kronos created, and it was far juster and better. It was the breed divine of the men who were heroes. They are called demigods, and were the race before us over the boundless earth. Some of them evil war and the dreadful battle cry killed at Thebes of the seven gates in the country of Cadmus, fighting for the flocks of the sons of Oedipus, and others too in their ships over the seas, great gulf, the war, having brought to Troy for the sake of fair trust Helene. Some of them their fated end of death unfolded, but to others Zeus, son of Kronos, gave a livelihood and a homeland. Far from men he settled them in the distant limits of earth, and there they live, their hearts untroubled by care, and the islands of the blessed, by the deep eddying ocean, fortunate heroes, for whom thrice yearly the honey-sweet harvest blooms, born by the earth, and giver of corn, but thereafter I would I were not among the fifth men, but rather had died before I had been born at a later time. For now indeed is the race of iron, and never a day's space shall they cease from toiling and wretchedness, nor have a night without continuity of destruction. The gods will give them gnawing anxious cares. 
Yet even in their evils there shall be a mixture of good. Zeus will destroy these also, this race of mortal men, when even at their birth they shall be gray at the temples. When father shall be at one with his children, nor they with him, nor guest with host, nor friend with friend, nor brother, shall be friends as before. These people shall dishonor their parents, even at the moment of aging. They will fault them with words of abuse. Cruel they will be, knowing nothing of the gods' vengeance. Nor will they give to their parents in age a return for the cost of their rearing. Nor shall oath-keeping have any grace among them, nor yet justice, nor good. Rather shall they honor the weaker of evil, the man who is insolent. Justice shall be in their hands only, and shame shall be no more. The evil man shall injure the better, speaking with crooked lies, and swear with an oath to top them. Envy shall attend all wretched mankind, envy malicious in voice, delighting in ill with a face of hatred. And on that day to Olympias, away from the broad-wayed earth, to join the tribe of immortals, and to leave men behind, shame and retribution go, but misery and pain are left for mortal men, and there shall be no cure for ill. Here is a fable for the kings, although they are knowing themselves. This is what the hawk said when he spoke to the dapple-necked songbird. High up in the clouds, the hawk gripped her with talons and took her. Pitifully she screamed, pierced by the nails, cramped in her, by the hawk overmastering, spoke to her, and this was his word. You fool, why have you screamed so? He that has you is far stronger, and you go where I shall bring you, even if you are a songster. If I will, I will make a meal of you, or will I let you go? He is witless who seeks to contend with rivals stronger than he is. He loses the fight, and besides suffers pain and shame together. So said the hawk, swift flying bird with long outstretched wings. Persis, you listen to justice. Do not magnify your insolence, for insolence is bad in man of insignificance. Not even a great man can carry her, but she is a heavy burden to him when he has met his disasters. The other road that leads to justice is better to travel by, for justice in the end comes out over insolence. He is a fool only who understands when he suffers. Oath runs quickly alongside judgments that are crooked. There is a clamor as justice is dragged away where men lead her, men who gobble up gifts, giving judgments with crooked justice. But justice follows weeping to cry the city and haunts of the people, wearing a mantle of mist, bringing evil to those of mankind, who shall drive her out, and have not rendered her straightly. But those who give straight decisions to strangers and citizens, and in no way transgress the limits of justice, their city blooms and the folk blossom in it. Peace that rears the young men is in their land, nor against them does loud-voiced Zeus set savage war as witness of his judgment, nor ever does famine attend them, those men that deal in straight justice, nor yet infatuate blindness at their feasts. They eat their land's crops on which they spent their care. For them the land gives a generous crop, and the mountain, the top of the oak tree, bears acorns, and its middle, the honey bees. Their woolly sheep are weighed down with heavy fleeces. Their women give birth to children like their parents. With all good things, utterly they prosper, nor do they voyage on ships, but the grain-given earth yields them its fruits. 
but those given to over to wickedness, outrage, and cruel deeds. Against them the son of Kronos, loud voice Zeus, set as witness of his judgment, retribution. Often, too, the whole city shares in what befalls a bad man, a sinner contrived of reckless mischief. Upon such men the son of Kronos sends from heaven a great disaster, a famine, and with it a plague. The people die, the women bear no children, the homes dwindle through the plains of Zeus of Olympus. In other places again the son of Kronos destroyed a great army of theirs, or their forts, or their ships on the sea he took from them. You kings, take heed yourselves too, of this your giving of injustice. No, for near at hand among men are the immortals that take heed and do justice of those who with crooked judgments grind one another down and do not drink of the anger of God. Thirty thousand there are on the earth that feeds many, immortals, guardians of Zeus, of mortal men, to watch over the judges' decisions and their deeds of cruelty. These put a ma un mantle of mist and travel everywhere over the land. There is also the maiden Justice, daughter of Zeus, revered and valued. She is in the sight of the Olympian gods, and whenever someone injures her by crookedly scorning her, immediately she takes her place beside Zeus, her father, the son of Kronos, and complains, bemoaning the mind of the men of injustice, so that the people may pay for the reckless sins of the kings in perverting the course of justice and suits by crooked speeches, thinking thoughts that are ruined. Watch these things, you kings, and straighten your speeches, you gobbler of gifts, and forget utterly your crooked decisions. A man working ill to another works ill to himself, and wicked counsel is wicked to the wicked giver. The eye of Zeus sees all, takes note of all, and if he please, he watches this too unerringly. What kind of justice this is which the city contains in itself. Were not that so, I would not be just myself nor would I have my son so, for it is a bad thing to be just, and the unjust should get more justice than the just man. But I do not believe that yet Zeus of counsel I will make such an ending. Perseus, do you lay up these things in your mind and listen to justice, forgetting entirely violence? For this is the rule for men, that the son of Kronos has given for the fish and the beasts and the winged birds that they should devour one another for they have no justice among them but to man he has given justice and she proves to be far the best for if a man of his knowledge wills to speak justly to him loud voice Zeus grants prosperity but to him will lie by witness Swearing falsely, consciously, and injuring justice shall fall to sin past cure. His generation after him is left weaker, but the generation of just swearing man bears better than before. What I say to you, great fool Persis, is said from goodwill. Badness there is, and easily for crowds to choose it. But for goodness the gods immortal have placed sweat in its way. The road is long and sheer that leads to it, and rough at the first. But when you are come to the high point, then thereafter it is easy. But still it is hard enough that man is the best who knows of himself all matters. When he has taken notice, which is better to past and future, but good also is he who obeys the man who speaks wisely. But he who is neither wise himself nor will hear another and lay it up in his mind, that man is surely useless. But Persis, do you remember that I urge and work 
Work, Persis, stock of Zeus, that hunger may hate you, and Demeter love you, fair garland revered, and fill your granary with grain for livelihood. For the man who won't work, you notice, has hunger as constant companion. The gods are angry with such a man, and men too, when he lives without working, in temper like stingless drones who eat but don't work, wearing out the fruit of the bee's labor. Let it be dear to you to arrange your work in due measure, that your granaries may be filled with seasonable grain. It is from the work they do that men become flock masters and rich, and as they work, they are much dearer to the immortals. So shall you be to immortals, too, sure for surely they hate the unworking. There is no shame in working, but the shame is in not working. If you work, your workless fellow will very soon envy you as you grow rich, for virtue and esteem both attend on riches. Whatever your fortune in life, it is better to work. If only you can work, turn your sinful thoughts away from another's possessions, and to your own work take heed of your livelihood. As I advised, there is an evil shame that attends on the needy man, for shame greatly injures men and benefits them also greatly. Shame goes with the want of prosperity, but confidence with prosperity. Riches are not for grabbing. When God gives them, they are far better, for even with violent hand you win a great fortune, or take it as booty with your tongue, as happens so often, when profit deceives men's minds and shameless drives out shame. Such a man in God's easily maim, and make meager his household, and only for a moment in time does prosperity attend him. Such, too, is the lot of one who wrongs suppliant or stranger, or again, who so goes to the bed of his brother's wife in secret lust, committing acts that contrary right, or the one who in thoughtlessness wrongs someone's orphan child, or taunts an old father standing on old age's cruel threshold. With him Zeus himself is angry, and in the end for his deeds of injustice, imposes a bitter requital. No, from such acts keep your sinful mind at a distance, and to the best of your power make sacrifice to the immortals, purely and cleanly, and burn the glorious thigh bones after, and at other times with libations and sacrifice propitiate. The gods, when you go to your rest, and when the sacrifice light comes, that they may have toward you a heart and a mind that is gracious, that you may buy another's farm rather than he buys yours. Invite your friend to supper, but let your enemy be. Most of all, invite him who is your nearest neighbor. For if anything untoward happen on your estate, your neighbor comes ungirdled, but your kin only after they are girdled. A bad neighbor is a calamity as great as a good one is a blessing. A man who has won a good neighbor has surely won good value. An ox would never be lost if your neighbor had not been a bad one. Take good measure from your neighbor and give him again good measure with just the same measure or better if you can do so that when you need him, again, you can rely on finding him. Make no ill profits. Ill profits are just so much loss. Love one that loves you. Meet him that is ready to meet you. Give to the one who gives. Do not give to the ungiver. One gives to the giver of gifts, but he that gives no gifts gets none. Give is good, grab is bad, the gift that grab gives is death. The man of sheer good will gives, although the gift be a great one, rejoices in his spirit and delights in the depth of his spirit. But the one who takes away from another because shamelessness is his master, though the thing itself 
be small. The frost seizes his very heart. For if you place a small thing on top of something small and do so often enough, there will soon be a big thing in being. He who carries to add to what is there shall keep fiery anger away, and no one who is ever vexed by what is stored in his house. It is better that it should be at home. What is abroad is endangered. It is good to have store to choose from, but a pain to the spirit to lack what you have not. That is something I bid you take heed of.